welcome to the New York Society for General Semantics. We're so glad you could come and join us for tonight's program. And uh, it, see, it does seem that we are doing uh, a number of uh, book-oriented programs uh, this springtime. Uh, so we're pleased to uh, continue in, in that vein and to keep continuing uh, in, in that vein. So let me note um, that while we look forward to tonight's uh, program, we will also be having our next uh, session on Friday, April 12th, uh, same bat time and same bat channel or radio. Um, and it's going to feature Marty Levinson uh, and his uh, new book, uh, is it more practical? No, just practical. Oh, practical <laughs> tales for everyday living. <laughs> practical fairy tales for everyday living. And what was the date again? Everyday living, April 12th. April 12th. Yes, which is a Friday evening. Um, and uh, and this, uh, Marty is of course the president of the Institute of General Semantics and as always we encourage you to become members of the Institute of General Semantics which you can easily do online at generalsemanticsoneword.org um, and you'll receive among other things a subscription to the journal, etc. Um, and uh, that this book is being published uh, through the non-Aristotelian library, the general semantics publishing program. Okay, thanks, you couldn't go earlier, huh? Um, <laughs> so, uh, so that'll be the third in a row of our book-oriented sessions on April 12th, but it will also be a, a special session of, um, that will um, launch the Alan Flagg lecture. Alan Flagg was a longtime president of the New York Society for General Semantics, and this is being uh, instituted um, in his name. We're not going to say in his memory because Alan believed that he is, he'd still be around, um, and we'll honor that. Hopefully, his consciousness is still alive. Um, yeah. Okay. And uh, so we're so pleased to to uh, tonight to have this uh, special program, and uh, that is uh, going to be hosted and moderated by Terry Manzella, who is right here. Um, and uh, I'm going to be very happy to turn over uh, the proceedings to her in just a moment. I'll just mention, and you can read a nice bio uh, about her, you probably did in the uh, online and in the email. Uh, I'll just note that Terry is a member of the board of directors of the New York Society for General Semantics. Thank you. Turn over. You can applaud now. Thank you. Thank you. Well, tonight is not about me. It's about Mark I'm delighted to be here with my colleague and to be sharing about a beautifully written book. Today, the days with one foot in American culture and one foot in Indian culture. And I must say, since I know her for 40 years, she's an extraordinary woman. And of course, we will also discuss how culture and general semantics come into play with her story and everything else. Uh, before going further with intellectual concerns. Terry, could you speak louder? Uh, okay, can you hear me? All right, let me sit forward. Um, <coughs> well, I want to say that Basu is someone I love deeply and admire greatly because of her courage. She is a woman of courage, and her book will let you, her readings and her book will definitely prove it. I'd like to say something about writing as a process, the, and especially memoir as a personal process. Uh, this, is, uh, this is by Alice Walker. They asked her, what is the writing process? She said, the witnessing of a great soul, 
a magnificent spirit in action, a warrior whose mental weapons seem to come equally from heart and air, and whose soul is nourished by solitude and dreams. In other words, the right is courage. And I really think when you talk about your own life and your own struggles, that that requires absolutely the most courage because she's also subject and object of her own writing. Um, and so I feel it's important to send that accolade her way. Um, I'd like to also read something that was written online about her, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, Vasu's courage and honesty is present on every page of her book. This is a memoir you'll never forget. It's written from Vasu's heart and reveals her soul. For a ter first term writer to tackle a soul searching recollection of her own <coughs> life is courageous and terrifying. And that word really, I believe is true. <laughs> um, she reveals her innermost feelings and anxieties while at the same time showing her fear, her grit, and her determination. He also painted this particular reviewer, a, a vivid image that captured me. Vasu, as a young lady in Queens, learning how to drive a bicycle, ride a bicycle the way we all have, with her mother in a sari running after her, giving her that first push. And I think that image really is quite charming. Um, to, I want to say a little bit about general semantics, and Basu will do some selected reading. Uh, I've been intrigued by general semantics when I first started studying it 40 years ago. I met Basu in that doctoral program at the same time. And it has proven to be the most useful of any perspectives that I have studied. I took four doctoral courses on how to ask a question. <laughs> and I didn't learn as much in those four classes than I did from general semantics. And I think it's about thinking and learning how to think about thinking. And I can't recommend it more highly to those of you who are not acquainted with it on. And, and since our president, Marty, has written nine lovely books, and there are many things by Lance and others, if you're interested in learning how to think and think about thinking, <laughs> you're in the right place. We like that, thinking about thinking. <laughs> Um, and I will talk about it later in more detail about how it actually helped me. Um, but what it first attracted me was that it's based on science. And I was very fascinated with the idea of scientific method as a way of systematically designing a study and trying to put it into um, a format where it could be rec uh, repeated, replicated, and either refuted or added to. And I did learn th that sometimes when it's refuted, we learn more than when it works. And so I think that dovetails nicely with general semantics. Uh, and the idea that there is always more than we can ever explain or know, we use the word etc. And I think that that the scientific method is really a, a fabulous example of that. Um, so I think I'm going to just say one more thing about culture. Because Basu lived in two cultures, and I'd like to share with you what I found to be the most useful definition of culture, we know there are many, and I've heard people say, what the hell does culture mean? Well, I'm going to try to give you that the best one that I could find. <coughs> culture. 
Culture is the way of life, style of living of a group of people. A people's culture consists of their group habits of both doing and thinking. That's very important because doing means action and thinking, and thinking means belief. <coughs> so, a people's culture, much of it is accumulated over many generations and is handed down as tradition to be picked up and learned by the new members of the group. But the most important aspect I believe to remember about culture, culture does not refer to a group of people. It refers to the behaviors and beliefs of a group of people. And later we will talk a little bit about stereotyping and how that works. And it's related to observing behaviors and not, and in general semantics, we certainly do not want people to group everyone in a general way and label them because there's more that we don't know when we come from that sort of perspective. What we really want to know is what we can know within certain parameters and, and limits. Well, Batsu. Oh, I think I should say one more thing <laughs> <laughs> about her. Um, I think I moved it. This is what I believe about her book. She has written a beautiful, moving, and eloquent memoir. It relates to women, men, families, immigrants, everywhere. With honesty and love, she shows how our families of origin and our culture first saturate our awareness and then provide us traditions with roots that sustain and also constrain us. She's born in Madras, India, raised in Queens, New York, returned to India at 12. She paints a picture of her personal struggle for her own identity in conflict with two cultures and her commitment to education and finding a place in the world for her talent, given her a scribe, we should say, status in an Indian culture. There's very little wiggle room for women. So, true to to tradition, <laughs> this part, she was sheltered from contact with the opposite sex. If she was found holding the hand of someone, she could be disqualified from marriage. <clears throat> so to place it in context, in context, her arranged marriage took place at 16 years old. This is over a half a century before Me Too. And back then, women in America were still required to have their credit cards issued in their husband's name. And I can relate to that because I had my own credit card when I got married, and I decided I needed to change my name. And they wouldn't issue it to Teresa. I had to be Mrs. Claus. So it's quite shocking that this is a half century ago. So, It's a coming-of-age story and evolves against an ancient civilization that on many levels Vasu reveres, and you can see that she's dressed in a sari because that's so meaningful to her. She's been here, living in America, since she's 16, even though she's been back and forth quite a bit. She came here as a trailing spouse, her husband and she moved, I guess, three or four months after she was married. Yeah. They thrived in this culture, raised two children, had two wonderful careers. So it's a very poignant story of an Indian woman who I say 
She wears a traditional sari, but she says it's American as apple pie. And when you read her book, you will know why. Vasu, let's give her a hand in Thank you. Well, I want to thank you, Terry, for that, for the generous introduction. Thank you for that. I'd like to thank you all for coming to learn. Some of my old buddies from the media ecology department, you know, so really nice, you know, um, to be here with you. Um, as, you know, as Terry said, you know, just to give a little bit of a context, I guess, um, since the memoir sort of co covers, again, two very different cultures um, and the time period during the mid 1940s uh, until I got married in the mid 1950s. So it's uh, very, you know, talked about the last time. Um, my, you know, just a very a brief synopsis in the sense is that my father um, was a diplomat. You know, he joined the United Nations shortly after India. Um, got its independence in 1947. Um, he was the personal representative for Dag Hammarskjöld, who was the um, Secretary General of the UN uh, after Trig Lee. And my father's, uh, I guess, lifelong passion was for uh, nuclear disarmament. Um, it was during the Cold War, and his role at the UN was to try to get the Russians and the Americans to sit at the table to pass uh, the first nuclear test ban treaty. And, um, you know, this was his life's work. And um, so I admired him on that level. But of course, it meant the sacrifice of not being around very much as a father. Um, I have two brothers, and so most of my childhood is marked by his absence rather than his presence. Um, so we came to this country uh, when I was four months old, and we'll read about that. Um, and I grew up in Queens, uh, in Parkway Village to be specific. A little bit of history of Parkway, uh, which is also in the book, but I'm not going to read from, is the uh, UN quarters was first located in uh, Lake Success, New York. And, you know, they needed housing for this new personnel that were coming. And the residents of the place were adamant uh, about not opening up you know, any areas for foreigners to come and reside. And it took a lot of PR work and maneuvering and political uh, persuasion to get them to finally accept that we need to welcome this community, you know. Um, and, you know, the mayor at the time said, you know, just imagine, you know, it'll put our place on the map. Everybody will be so proud that Lake Success has welcomed an international community devoted to world peace. And that's how Parkway Village uh, became sort of my home uh, when I came to this country as a four-month-old child. Uh, the 600 units, you know, apartments were built strictly for UN personnel. And so it was in what you might call today like a gated community, mm -hmm. all right? Most of the people who I knew when I was growing up were all children of uh, UN families. There were other families as well. But, you know, this is how sort of the UN families found a home in New York when the institution uh, was founded. And it was, again, you know, I'm going to read a little bit about what that was like to grow up in that community at that particular time in the mid-1940s. Um, and then, as Terry pointed out, you know, at the age of 12, 
my mother and my two brothers and I, we went back. I come from Madras. I was born. It's now called Chennai, but at the time it was called Madras. I was born there. Uh, I'm um, really um, what you might call a, a, not even a child of independence. I was due on August 15th, which was India's Independence Day. And my parents had a name all picked out for me, which meant goddess of freedom. But I was stubborn, <laughs> I guess, you know, and um, I didn't, <laughs> I wasn't born until 10 days later. So I was actually August 25th. And so they had to scramble to find another name for me. And oh. my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, uh, named me Vasundara, uh, which is my full name, it's a Sanskrit name and it means beautiful earth mm -hmm. and um, so uh, as I was saying you know sort of uh, growing up in that environment uh, it was a unique experience you know to be with uh, all these UN families and then when I went back to uh, at the age of 12 and uh, there were reasons for that that I went back to India, you know, my mother in particular was very afraid that I would start dating American boys, <laughs> and uh, God knows what those, would happen, oh, you know. Those dangerous oh, American dangerous boys. Dangerous American boys. <laughs> totally. And she, uh, you know, said to my father, it's time that we go back, you know, unless if I was, I guess, you know, we about that, you know, pre-puberty age, and so we went back, which was a sudden shock, particularly to me as a, as a girl uh, living in that culture. So we went back in 1959, um, and then I expected, you know, sort of long-term that India would be my home, but sadly my father died in 1962, and uh, he was in Geneva. By that time, he had shifted to the Geneva office, the Palais de Nation in Geneva. And then the whole world was sort of, you know, topsy-turvy. With his death, he was only 50 when he died. Um, I was um, just about 13 years old. And uh, no, actually a bit more, close to 14. And my two brothers and my widowed mother. And so she made the decision to stay in India. And then I sort of talk about her decision to get me married at a young age. And it just turned out, I guess, that the person she chose for me, the mathematician, my husband at NYU, um, was coming back to New York uh, to do his uh, mathematical research. So in many ways, my life came full cycle. You know, I didn't come back to Queens, but I came back to New York, all right? So that's sort of very briefly the trajectory of where I started and where I wound up. And I've lived here in New York now for 50, Five years. She eats oh. apple pie on Thanksgiving. I don't, I don't like apple pie. I wish she had said chocolate. I'm a chocolate <laughs> You know, one thing that impressed me greatly in reading the book, her mother's attitude that Vasu needed to become a traditional Indian woman. And, you know, when I first read it, I said, well, what does that mean? But then I learned, as she will tell you, what that means. Yes, I look traditional. I always tell my students I'm a, I'm a teacher at NYU at the Gallison School. So whenever I walk into the classroom, the students kind of look at me thinking, oh, that she speak English or no. <laughs> and then they hear this, you know, what Professor Postman used to call the Queen English. <laughs> <laughs> he said, Basu, if there's anybody, it's you who speaks the Queen English. <laughs> 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 Yeah. No, I, I don't have a Queen's accent. I don't know. I do have an American accent. You know, it just doesn't fit. I always feel like I'm a walking contradiction. What do they say in India when they hear you speaking? About your accent? No, then I change my accent when I go back. Ah. You know, oh, I do that yeah. head bobble. Thing, you can do that. Wow, um, that's great. What? Wonderful. <laughs> 
so, you know, the students always look at me wondering, you know, uh, you know, who do we have here? So I always tell them the sorry hides a multitude of things. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let me, uh, I'm going to begin from the beginning. All right. I was five months old in 1948 when we moved into our first apartment. And though it was home to the first five years of my childhood, the only proof of my existence is in a handful of old black and white photographs. I in a playpen, clad in a baby bunting, staring into the eye of the camera. And another one of my mother in a striped sari, holding, cuddling my infant brother in her arms. Over the years, I could only rely on hearsay to fill the gap. The origin of my own childhood memories took root when I was six years old, at which time we had moved into another apartment on 144-67 Charter Road in Parkway Village. Apartment B was a duplex, with the living and dining area downstairs and three bedrooms with two bathrooms, one attached, uh, Upstairs. The living room was a melange of east and west. A castle convertible sat solidly on the burgundy Bukhara carpet, its pattern dating back to the Mughal rulers of India. An idol of Shiva, in the fiery form of Natraja, the lord of the dance, stood in sharp contrast under a portrait of a serene looking Buddha. Small niches staring out at the black and white Zenith television that occupied center place in the living room. A credenza in the dining area stored the good china that would be trotted out for the many dinner parties my parents hosted. The thalis or stainless steel plates we ate on daily had their own cupboard in the kitchen. The rosewood dining table with its protective felt pad <coughs> with a plastic red and black checkered tablecloth to be replaced by one of damask linen for special occasions. There was a never time that it lay naked. The beauty of the rosewood buried permanently under a shrub. Nevertheless, it was the heart of our home. We did our homework, ate our meals, had our spats, chatted with our friends, and communed with our family. The process of adaptation was both painful and difficult for UN families, particularly for the South Indian Brahmin, particularly for the South Indian Brahmin families like mine. Hailing as they did from a lineage of rigid orthodoxy, steeped in ritual, their very act of crossing the ocean was considered an act of pollution in the mind of the elders a blight on the family name. Having committed this transgression, which was beyond atonement, it became all the more imperative that they preserve as many aspects of tradition as they probably could. The onus of carrying out this, of carrying this out fell squarely on the shoulders of the wives, while their husbands, preoccupied, with more worldly matters, played a perfunctory role. Whether it be religion, food, or dress, there was nothing accessible in the immediate environment. No Hindu temples, no provision stores, and no sari shops. The rich diversity created by the UN in Parkway Village was a unique phenomenon for its time. But it was a self-contained diversity restricted to the perimeter of the surroundings. It was assumed the needs of the community could be met from within. The tug of home and the fear that their heritage would be lost if the children became too Americanized bred a certain recalcitrance in many of these Brahmin mothers, including my own. As a necessary first step, they brook no compromise when it came to food, dress, and ritual worship. Many homes became microcosms of an imagined India, mine being no different. 
clutching an unopened book while a group of girls jump rope and another group play hopscotch. I hope against hope for an invitation to join, to join in only to hear the alarm bell signal that recess is over. I should have known better given the contempt they held towards me. How could I have forgotten the daily taunts on the school bus when no one would sit next to me yelling, brown-faced monkey, as they walked up the aisle? On a dare, a boy, and it was always a boy, would be exhorted by the others to spit on my skin to see if the color rubbed up. He was shocked that the color of my skin held fast and barely noticed my own shock as I hastily wiped away the slimy saliva with the sleeve of my coat. Lunchtime was a nightmare as they passed the cucumber cheese sandwich packed by my mother around the table, taking turns to spit on it before returning it to me. I endured it all without complaint, not wanting to be called a tattletale on top of all the other epithets hurled at me. I was not one to bring home tales out of school, and I seriously doubted if my parents would have listened anyway. Mm -hmm. I chose to suffer in silence that first year until one day, well into my second year, I could take it no more. The nasty group of boys on the bus cornered me as I got off. I was pushed to the ground and stomped on. Someone tore at the green pom-poms of my brand new scarf-like hat, sending me into an uncontrollable rage. It was a present from my mother, and I had worn it for the first time that day. The way they clawed at it felt like a violation of her love for me. It was enough to bring me to my feet and fight back, making them flee. My knees all wobbly, I managed to make it home. I stumbled into the arms of my mother, who grew alarmed by my appearance, cuts and bruises on my leg, my brand new scarf missing its pom-poms. I shed two abominable years worth of tears, repeating again and again how much I hated school. This time I kept nothing back. Every taunt, every contemptible act was described in detail. I'd rather be stupid the rest of my life than go back to that school I cried out, surprised at my own outburst. Learn to adjust, Vasu, my mother said, as she bandaged my knee. No violence, Vasu, just turn the other cheek, my father sagely advised in a Gandhi-like manner. Remember, he continued, sticks and stones can break your bones, but words can never harm you something we don't believe in general semantics. <laughs> their Words can harm you. That's why I'm here. <laughs> their tepid reaction infuriated me all the more and made me feel as if I had done something wrong. The next day, I begged to stay home, but my mother felt compelled to drag me along to the principal's office to get to the bottom of things. I was asked to sit outside. A little while later, my mother emerged with a look that was hard to read. Mrs. Axelrod feels you don't mix with the other children and that you prefer to sit by yourself with a book. She thinks you are maladjusted, she said, in a tone that sounded accusatory. I got the gist of the message without knowing what maladjusted meant, but continued to protest. No one wants to play with me. They won't let me in their games. The school year ended, I remained an outcast. The only memories that have prevailed were the food that the rest of me sucked into a black hole of oblivion. The ugly countenance of racism had forced itself into our home like the snake in the Garden of Eden. It rattled my parents and assaulted their sensibilities. In India, their Brahmin pedigree denoted a higher status among all the other castes, a status that embodied characteristics of purity, virtue, which made them immune to the more pernicious traits assigned to the lower caste. 
who arrive in America and bear witness to the opprobrium heaped on their Brahmin daughter was unthinkable. They could tolerate being different. They would not tolerate being inferior. As far as they knew, racism in America was reserved for Negroes. Indians were in another category, so they thought. Fearful that even dire consequences would follow, I was taken out of PS-17 and enrolled at the United Nations International School at Eunice the very next year. I was given a hearty welcome by Mrs. Brown, a third grade teacher. To be Indian in her class was to be the subject of much curiosity among my classmates. In a matter of weeks, everyone knew where India was on the world map, what food I ate, what my native costume was, and what language was spoken at home. I finally got to play hopscotch and jump rope double dutch style. An international food festival and a cultural program featuring the music and dance of different nationalities rounded off the school year. Above all, that first year at Eunice made me proud to be Indian. The traditions of home, many of which I had come to tolerate without question, became a source of ethnic pride and something to be shared in the universe that was Eunice. Even the pavade, which is the long skirt I wore, seems to be merely a costume. And for the first time, an occasion presented itself where I, much like my mother in her sari, was proud to proclaim my identity, my identity in the homespun fabric of my native land. I'd like to say something about racism in general and how general semantics is useful to combat it. <clears throat> um, but before I say that, two things. Um, this, this idea of your parents not even being able to absorb the idea as Brahmins that you could ever be treated anything but as an upper class girl, you were a girl at the time. This happened to one of our colleagues in media ecology who came from an upper crust background. And this friend uh, told me that um, he was taking a summer course that was three weeks long. And I just remembered it now. And he, he said that the people in the class which were treating him a bit shabbily or peculiarly. Something I have never experienced in my life. Will you come to the class? And so I decided I would go to the class and see what the story was. And when I said, I'll tell you what I think. You have a Spanish name, according to these people, even though you're not Spanish. And they think that you are a poor scholarship student here instead of the upper crust spoiled brat that you are. <laughs> <laughs> and this person said to me, this is impossible. And so this was exactly the, uh, the, the experience of your parents. This person had never experienced anything but positive feedback from everyone that we came into contact. So the solution was, well, and here's what's interesting. They were speaking in French to each other, insulting them. And he understood it. And this is why he said, I'm being talked about. I'm being labeled. I don't understand this. So I said, well, here's the solution. I'll come next time again, because we first were going to, as, as we were told in media ecology, travel in pairs so that you could get the context two eyes are never enough. Mm. And so we came back again the next night, because it was an every night class, and I heard them speaking, and I said, you have to speak in French, and shock them out of their chair, and that's what ended it. So that's a good media ecology story, but in terms of the prejudice yeah, that I'd like to talk yeah. about, before you do, can I just take a quick bathroom? Yes. Right, you know what I'm going to say. You know what it is? Yes, just one second. No, I'll be back. Sure, I'll be back. 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 I'll be
I was talking to Vasu about stereotypes and, the re and what they mean and how they work. And, uh, and another thing that completely shocked me about her experience at school, this was before she was eight years old. And according to Piaget, we are not logical thinkers until we're 11, and we look very literally at the world until we're six or seven. And I have experience with the young children in my life, if they see someone different, uh, their reaction is, um, oh, it's that brown person over there, with no other label around. And so it's unfortunate what, at the time period of, of Vasu that I don't, I, it was very hard for me to understand this bullying um, based on uh, children who, who are so young that they are not even there, but I guess bullying occurs uh, at very young ages, even before you're supposed to have operational thinking that allows you to look abstractly. Uh, so it was quite a shock to me. And then I realized when people made fun of me because I had very bad eye problems that I looked a little odd one day and then like a regular kid the next day, I had two older siblings. And I could always say, I'll get them after you, leave me alone. <laughs> and this is something Basu missed out on. But, you know, and, and of course I, I had different parents, of course, who told me it's they, they're the problem, not you. But I want to talk about stereotyping and how it works. All stereotypes are based on observations. And these observations are usually have some truth. And they operate in some particular context. But as we say <coughs> in general semantics, the math can never really uh, display the territory. And so stereotypes are always inaccurate. But why do they persist? They persist because once we have a stereotype in mind, and right now in our, on our world we see a lot of this happening, which is why I decided it's something to talk about. Um, when we see someone who fits a stereotype, we say, oh, right, there it is. And we check off, we confirm it. When we see something that refutes a stereotype, we say, oh, that's the exception. And that's how it continues to live within the society. And in general semantics, we are warned not to reify things like that, mm -hmm. to make them real and to understand that there's always more going on than we can ever know. And I think uh, stereotyping is sort of dangerous, but we know even Mother Teresa admitted, my namesake, admitted to having stereotypes in her young life. And I think the only thing that we can do is capture our own and work again. And at, at one time, I taught a course for six months for the police department, and it was called, you know, sensitivity training on learning racism, something like that. And how we did it, was just to say, let's not pretend, and I would put up Puerto Ricans, Jews, Italians, <coughs> Irish, as many things, and believe me, they could list every stereotype that, you know, exists. And so that's how anti-Semitism operates, that's how all prejudices operate. People grab onto ideas that do not represent a group, which is why when I spoke about culture, I just wanted to say that, that culture is not a group of people. It is the behavior and attitude of people within that group. And unfortunately, Vasu had that experience, but that went off to have a fairly nice life <laughs> at the next school where she was double jumping. What what you call a double dutch? Double dutch. And and that was a better fit for her. And I think parents now have more of an understanding of that than that the United maybe Nations our parents school did. was, uh, you know, unique for its time. With, uh, but at the same time, uh, I have to say it was like living in a bubble. Mm -hmm. Because don't forget, you know, uh, this was like, you know, the early 1950s. 
there was still Jim Crow, there were all these atrocities being, you know, committed towards, you know, blacks in the South. And all of that was just unknown to us. You know, in school when they taught history, it wasn't that part of American history at all. And so in many ways, you know, um, I was more aware of some of those injustices because they had been, you know, uh, leveled at me. So I had not experienced, most of my classmates had no idea what was going on, you know. Um, so on the positive side, yes, it's a welcoming environment. But it is also one that, in many ways, as I said, you know, shelters you and in some ways makes you very ignorant of what's really going on. Um, my sense of who I was and where I belonged was in constant flux, depending on which world I inhabited. Its locus either drawing me in or consigning me to its borders. My earlier hostile encounters at PS 117 shocked me into the realization that to be born with brown skin was to be cast in the role of a pariah. The UNIS, which is the United Nations School acronym, on the other hand, celebrated my Indian heritage as a novel phenomenon. Much like an exotic curio, I was put on display along with other equally exotic curios. Out of school, this bond of internationalism common to my classmates and me held but a tenuous grip over us. We were only too eager to rid ourselves of all these labels affixed to our identity. The daily diet of American pop culture held us in thrall and turned us into avid consumers. We became fans of Archie and Veronica, <laughs> devouring every comic book we could lay our hands on. We spent a penny from our allowance on Bazooka Bubblegum, mm -hmm. holding contests to see who could blow the largest bubble. We splurged by sending a whole nickel on Lickamade candy, biting <laughs> into the wax bottle to get a truly liquid which left that I ugly stain. <laughs> I love those things. Not that we cared. We, ado we adopted the families on TV shows like Father Knows Best, Leave It to Beaver, and Ozzy and Harriet, mm -hmm. and wished our families could be like them. Mm -hmm. We began to build another world for ourselves, away from home and the prying eyes of our parents. A world in which my compatriots and I saw ourselves at least in North America. I would have gladly embraced the Indianness in me had it been on my own terms. My mother, unlike the other Tamilian mothers, ins insisted I strip myself of Western attire and don the Indian Havare every evening. She made it seem I could not be Indian or become one while wearing American dresses and pedal pushers. Yes, I wanted to be both Indian and American, free to select the face of each culture to create an amalgam I could call my own. My parents' attempt to enforce a dichotomy between the two cultures as a defense against assimilation only succeeded in making me feel less than whole. I gave birth to different selves, each like a Russian nesting doll encased in its own shell. Mm -hmm. At school, my identity was tied to my nationality, as if I were an ambassador for my country, India. At home and among other South Indian families, I was expected to behave like a good Brahmin girl. I felt most free to be what I wanted to be when indulging in American pastimes. At times, I wished I were an orphan, accountable to no one but myself. Unwilling to plant both feet firmly in American soil, my parents chose to straddle it with one foot permanently anchored in India. It was an unequivocal indication 
that their sense of place was inextricably tied to their motherland. I, on the other hand, felt rootless, the ground beneath my feet shifting with each step. Um, I'm, you know, since I am a media apologist, I'm going to read from what I call my American Indian childhood. The ubiquitous presence of television ushered in certain aspects of American culture, much to my parents' consternation. <laughs> my father exercised his parental authority during the short periods that found him home by monitoring the TV westerns that had become part of our regular fare. Wild, big, wild Bill uh, Hickok, with his popular utterance, shoot first and ask questions afterwards, <laughs> was anathema to a man who feared the consequences of such advice in matters of nuclear war. The show was summarily banned from our list of favorites. Oh. Well-spoken heroes like Hopalong Cassidy, Gene Autry, and Roy Rogers received approval for their high reserve and uh, for their reserve and high sense of fair play. We accepted these restrictions, more amused and intimidated, as a quirk of my father's nature. And as soon as he left, Wild Bill Hickok resumed his rightful position in the pantheon of American cowboys. My mother, left again to fend for herself, was grateful to have the TV as her babysitter. She assumed its influence to be contained within the screen, and hence, harmless. When mm -hmm. I turned 11, she came to realize just how mistaken her judgment had been. It was the era of rock and roll, the music of Elvis Presley, Bobby Darin, the Platters, the Monotone, Jerry Lee Lewis, <laughs> Danny and the Junior, filled the, air, filled the radio with. Don't somebody recognize it. <laughs> we all do. <laughs> <laughs> we loved it. The 50s. We loved it. Yeah, I loved the 50s. The 50s. <laughs> yeah, early. No one was immune to the infectious beat and plaintive melodies. Not even my father, who could be heard crooning to the lyrics of Sonny James' Young Love. <laughs> My older brother, Ramu, by now a teenager, hogged our small record player, spinning his budding collection of 78s and 45s in the night The music created a bond between us for the first time since he came home from boarding school. <laughs> it was a communal partaking of American popular culture, quite different in its effect from our watching TV together, tapping our feet and wriggling our bottoms as we belted out the lyrics. We looked at each other with conspiratorial delight as we tacitly acknowledged the thrill of feeling very American in our Indian home. Rock and roll fever gripped me hard, and I became an avid watcher of Dick Clark's American Band, <laughs> which had premiered a year earlier in 1957 on the ABC network. Rock and roll idols appeared in the flesh to the adulation of fans all over the country. The dance couple contest taught millions how to do the Lindy, Soul, and the Box set. My girlfriends and I spent our lunch hours in school speculating on the off-screen love life of these couples, taking votes on which pair would wind up at the altar and which pair never stood a chance. I sneaked whatever opportunity I could, I could get to watch the show, which conveniently aired at 4 p.m. after the close of school. My mother would have been mortified had she seen me dance and twirl in our living room, grasping the curtain string as an imaginary partner. It would have made matters worse had she known that I longed for a real-life American boy to hold me in his arms as we slow dance to only you. <laughs> to the extent possible, I, that was me. Uh, 
To the extent possible, I balance the demands of home with my increasing appetite for American pop culture. My see, I used to meet my girlfriend in the laundry room and dance with her. My secret rendezvous with Sheeta continued with my mother, not the wiser. But when I sought her permission to go to the movies with my girlfriend, there were a few rules I had to follow. Only matinees, no evening shows. I had to be accompanied by at least two girlfriends, uh, known to my mother, and these were Sheikha and Ann Wall, my two best friends from childhood. As they stood before her, she issued a stern warning. Vasu can only go if you promise she sits between you two. I don't want her sitting next to some boy in the dark. That's how things get started. I wasn't quite sure what Amma meant by sing, other than a boy's hand brushing against mine. But I was sufficiently embarrassed, even as I managed to stifle a smile, as my girlfriends, each with a look of feigned seriousness, nodded in that sense. But it's the Ten Commandments I whined. It's about the Bible. And the things we should not commit. But when it came to protecting her daughter, the only faith my mother had was in herself. I could have easily disobeyed my mother and counted on my friends not to tell, but I lacked the temerity to do so. Besides, it would be a sin to tell a lie. <laughs> As the lights dimmed, I eased into the middle seat, safely ensconced between my friends. Oh, Birthday parties where boys would be in attendance, or what my mother referred to as mixed parties, were taboo. It effectively shut me out of the emergent social scene of my peers, and I was soon dropped from the invitation list. With the quickening darkness of the fall season, the time I spent outdoors was shortened, more so than in previous years. Immured in the apartment for longer periods of time, I took to staring out my bedroom window as the light began to fade. All these restrictions, whether they had to do with the type of company I should keep or where I could go, came without warning or explanation. I had promised my father to be an obedient girl in his absence, a promise I simply could not break. I performed what was expected of me when home and grew into my role as the good Indian daughter. But the blinking eye of our television had cast an American shadow over our very Indian home, seducing me with its pixelated images. Oh, sorry. Pixelated images, sorry, of happy families like the Cleavers and the Andersons, where children were children, free of adult responsibilities, the girls dated and the boys had crushes. At the end of each episode, the growing pains of childhood were ameliorated through the wise counsel of both parents. These elegant TV homes with their white picket fences beckoned me with open arms. Not a hint of danger was visible anywhere. In my mind, the setting could have easily been possible. My mother's incipient fear that I would become an object of depredation, of unknown prominence, rattled me. Too young to comprehend the source of her trepidation, I was determined to have some fun, even if, even if it meant I had to sneak around. I was drawn to American popular culture, be it reading comic books, on the sly at a friend's house, or dancing to rock and roll music in the laundry room. By immersing myself in all things American, I freed myself of my mother's protective fold, which felt like a noose slowly tightening around my neck. Uh, from here, it's going to be, uh, in a way, what Mao said. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing good, by the way. <laughs> Only good. But, um, oh, okay. Um, so, 
I uh, stopped sort of, you know, in uh, my childhood. You know, a few years, I guess, after that, uh, we left to go to India. It was in 1959. Um, as I said, uh, you know, it's you know, I don't want to give too much away, hoping you will read my book. You know, uh, but there was a nasty incident that happened uh, when I was uh, in Parkway. Uh, dealing with a boy, you know, I was attacked by a, uh, a young boy, and um, this rattled my mother no end, you know, for fear, particularly of my uh, chastity, and it was the impetus for us uh, to move back. And so here I am now, back in uh, Madras, and we didn't have a home. It was a sudden decision. My parents were building a home at the time, but it was by no means complete. So I was forced to live in my grandfather's house. And he was an ultra-Orthodox Brahmin. You know, there are Brahmins who are Orthodox, but uh, very similar, I would think, like to the Hasidim. That's the only parallel that I can um, think of. So when I went back, um, I my father at the time was in Geneva. A lot had happened. He had had a heart attack uh, before we left. And my mother was torn about leaving us in India and my father in Geneva. She was sort of caught in this uh, double bind of taking care of us and then what about him? So she was in and out. She sort of deposited us in India with my uncle and my aunt. Mm -hmm. And then she was going, shuttling back and forth between Geneva and Madras. So my first couple of years in Madras, I was raised or looked after by my aunt and uncle. These are my father's uh, brother and his wife. They were a childless couple, and they accepted. They said to my mother, we'll keep an eye on the three children while you do this. And so my mother wasn't there when um, I was reaching puberty, all right? So this would be of interest to David, I think, you know, and then <laughs> work on administration, okay. The constant vigilance and dictates of custom really sapped the joy out of me. I was desperate to hear the, this is an Indian, I was desperate to hear the sound of my own laughter and rejuvenate my spirit from its moribund state. I grabbed every chance I could to saunter over to the girl's house next door so the simple pleasures of childhood games could be relished out in the open with no one looking over my shoulder. I spent Sunday afternoons mastering Palanguri, a game played with cowrie shells, and Puyan Kote, a game that tested prowess in the juggling and catching of tamarind seeds. I discovered how to thread flowers without a needle by looping and knotting natural tree twine over and under the stem. <coughs> I learned to adorn my hands with henna and how to make a paste by grinding the leaves with a small lump of tamarind whose acid content turned the normal orange hue into a fiery red. I looked at my friends so accepting of the norm, I found stifling and marveled in their ability to find delight in play. They made it possible to be a child amidst adults only too eager to rush them into womanhood. My first menstrual period arrived a year later. I felt betrayed by my own body, who seemed to announce that I was a young woman now and no longer a child. The first drops of blood in my underwear sent me into a panic. I was convinced I had contracted some dire food, food ailment like dysentery. I called out to my chitty, that's my aunt, and in the privacy of my room, I nervously showed her the stain that was beginning to spread. Am I sick, I asked, my heart in my mouth? Maybe I have tapeworms or something. <laughs> it could be from the hot mango pickle I ate. 
I am his press release. You have a stomachache? You're vomiting? My aunt said, no, 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 I feel fine. She looked at me intently and began to smile. You have become a grown-up girl. You must mark this date on the calendar, and in about 28 days' time, this will happen again. But what is it I have to anxiously? Where is all this blood coming from? Won't I die if it happens again? <laughs> Silly girl, all this is natural. You need not know anything else. Just do as I say. I'll write to your mother and tell her you have become an adult, she said with an air of humility. Nothing she said mollified me, and I was more bewildered than before. At the time, I just wanted to get clean and change my underwear. Chitty went to a closet and pulled out an old white dhoti. The dhoti is the, the, the dress that the man wears. It's just one piece of white cloth. She tore the cloth into strips and neatly folded them into pads. She gave me two safety pins and told me to secure the pads in the crotch of my panties. Mm -hmm. I was ill-prepared for what came next. You have to stay in this room for three days. Here's a bit of soap to wash the cloth. You cannot touch anyone as you are polluted now. I myself must go bathe again to become pure. I'll put out a plate and a tumbler outside your room for your meal. You will have to wash your own utensils and keep them inside the room. Make sure no one else touches them. But what about school? I can't miss three days, I whined. Yes, yes, you can go to school, but you have to leave and enter the house through the side alley. You cannot come into the main hall, she replied, and then added in English, you are now out of doors. The last phrase managed to make me smile in an otherwise grim situation. It was a clever use of the English language to describe a context that was so very Indian. I later came to learn that in olden times, it served as a euphemism for menstruating women who were forced into isolation in straw packed sheds at the outermost edge of the backyard, a good distance away from the main house. I thanked my lucky stars to be spared such an indignity. The purification ritual meant to be a reprieve, was harsher than the three-day confinement. Roused by my aunt at 4 a.m. on the fourth day, I was taken to the well in the backyard. The pre-dawn hour was deliberately chosen to ensure a modicum of privacy under the assumption that none of our neighbors would be up and at about that time. Chitty handed me a thin, transparent cotton towel, which I draped around me as I stripped myself bare. Cold and shivering in the semi-darkness, I crouched on the mossy bricks as she poured buckets of icy well water over me. The ablution complete, I stood up and was shocked to see the young men who rented rooms in the back of my neighbor's house rivet their eyes firmly on my body. I covered my breast with one arm while shielding my crotch with the other and fled inside. To be half naked in front of all those men after all the interminable lessons and modesty was too much to fathom. The violation I had suffered in Parkway Village at the hands of a stranger had made me dirty in my mother's eyes. This time, however, it was my own eyes that looked upon my body as an object of shame. No amount of water could make me pure again. An air parcel from Geneva arrived shortly after my first period. I was hoping it was a box of Swiss chocolate, a cover. My favorite, no such luck. Embedded in a box of protest stamps was a letter from my mother. Dear Vasuit began, your father and I are so proud to learn that you've become a big girl. Please read the directions on the box carefully. It tells you how to use the belt and attach the napkin. 
You don't have to use cloth anymore. I will be mailing more to you soon. Tell Chitty to give you these from now onward. Love, your Amma. Aww. No thanks to my mother, but mainly thanks to Kotex, but many thanks to Kotex, I discovered I had ova, or eggs, and according to the pamphlet, they lived in something called a uterus, and it was normal to discharge them in a bloody stream every month. All these terms were parts of my body and its inner workings made for a boring man. I saved the insert with its pictorial directions on how to use the belt and napkin and threw the pamphlet away. I could not fathom why my period was a source of pride to my parents. I was not feeling very grown up, and despite the terseness of her letter, I yearned to have my mother by my side and rescue me from the humiliation, the humiliation of these barbaric practices. Surely she must have known that Chitti would follow the rituals of menstruation without compromise. How could she have abandoned me at a time like this? Turning to my girlfriends next door for a show of empathy was in vain, for shortly after I started menstruating, so did my girlfriends. What I perceived as unnatural and cruel, they took to be normal. I was left to voice my protest in silence. The box of Kotex stopped the leakage and stilled the wagging tongues at school, but it did little to stanch the monthly cycle of dread and humiliation. And, 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 as moderator, I'd like to say the reason she mentioned David Lincoln, who's in our audience tonight, <laughs> is that he has in done a nice some way. research on menstruation and in particular and men. Male, male attitudes toward it and so on, and he's written poetry about it. So it's, it's a, an interest of him. And his book on the topic comes out next month. Just say. Okay. Just, you know, blog away. That's and fine. When, when I decided earlier in the evening, I to question him about how he got interested in this topic. And, you know, it's an unusual topic for a man. It so happens it relates to Prince Charles and the Camilla situation. Oh, with the <laughs> That we all know about. Um, and so my curiosity is satisfied about his interest. And uh, I'm sure it will be interesting to hear about his male perspective another time. Um, let me know if I'm, how the time is, you know. Uh, is everybody what okay? What time is it? Oh, that's a good question. Huh? Yeah, you because know, we want to have time for well, questions. Maybe like read one more section and then have some All questions. Right. Um, okay. Uh, all right, I'll give you a chance to uh, let me know. All right, um, when I went back, I uh, joined the Good Shepherd Convent. When I, I went to a parochial school run by the uh, Franciscan Sisters of Mary from Ireland. Um, so uh, Good Shepherd is where I got my high school degree from. So I have that sort of part about what it was like to be in Good Shepherd. Um, so it's a question of where you would like me to be. Uh, again, there's a lot in the book. The other one, uh, I'll just let you know, the other part is um, my arranged marriage to Raghu. Uh, That's very interesting. You know, is, um, you know, suddenly, like again, uh, barely a year after, my father died in 1962. And in 1963, after a year of mourning, uh, my mother <coughs> felt, you know, I should get married. So there's a section sort of I, I, I think on that. should tell us about that. Yeah, let me hear this. Yeah, let's read that. We live in a culture where, that, where um, we, we think we're free to choose, but I have something to say about how, true, how free we are. <laughs> OK, so. Um, all right, this is sometime in July, and I'm, you know, I've been going to school and, you know, just doing my homework and being a good little girl. And how old are you? I'm now, uh, you know, this is 1963, just turned 16, you know, uh, in August. And this is right before I turned 16. All right. 
Sure enough, as July approached, with the threat of the monsoon close on its heels, my mother uttered a symbol, decorative sentence. It's time to get you married. <laughs> Just like that. No fanfare, no easing me into a conversation, no explanation except to say, your dad died suddenly. God knows how long I'll live. If something happens to be, you'll be at the mercy of our relatives. There's no guarantee they will find a suitable boy for you. Better to arrange your marriage while I'm alive. I couldn't believe what I had just heard. Had I not done what I was told? The anger that had been simmering within me erupted. I lashed out. I'll study. I'll get a job. I'll be independent. If Papa were alive, he would have never agreed to this. He wanted me to study at the Sorbonne. What about my school, my education? My mother's pragmatic nature kicked in, and in an attempt to comfort me, she replied, I'll make sure the boy allows you to get a college degree. I'll make it a condition of the marriage proposal. The assurance in her voice did little to hearten me. I took a good hard look at my mother, the plight she was in, and felt torn between my concern for her welfare as well as my own. What's so unusual about this is that Vasu's mother had a and also had a master's degree from Queens College in psychology. And so to see that juxtaposition of her daughter must get married uh, was quite a shock for Vasu who was not prepared. But maybe instead of reading, you need to talk a little bit more about it because time is of the essence and people sure. want to ask you questions. I left the good part. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, go to the good yeah. part. Finish, finish yeah. telling us about, about that moment of encounter. Yeah. You teased yeah. us and yeah. we need to know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what, what moment of encounter are you the, 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 what the outcome of this? Of You're this finished direction? reading the passage. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, well, the, oh, the outcome, all right. Uh, where was I? The assurance in her voice did, a, did little to hearten me. I took a good hard look at my mother, the plight that she was in, and felt torn between my concern for her welfare as my own. I did not want to see her suffer more than she already had. And I told her softly, my voice filled with resignation, do what you have to do. Mm -hmm. So I did accept. I had a bride viewing, which is uh, all there uh, for you. And. Um, What's a bride viewing? Oh, the bride viewing is where a special day is set aside for the groom to come. You know, they. You know, uh, my mother got an offer for me, um, my present day husband of my past, and he came over to take a look at me and see what I was, um, you know, all about. And um, after that, you know, it's actually more um, the family that agree more than the girl and the boy. I never spoke to him. Uh, there's a whole section on um, the bride viewing. Um, my mother took my glasses off with the old adage, you know, boys don't make happen the girls do <laughs> oh So I happened to be nearsighted. <laughs> so you couldn't see Razu? Yeah, my husband's name is his well, his real name is Trino Atalada, and we called him Ragu, like the spaghetti sauce of the name. In any case, he came to my house, and all I could see was like a blob on the floor. Because oh, no. <laughs> he was a little bit on the heavy side, and I didn't know what he looked like, and I had to serve him coffee, and that's the closest I got. And I took a quick look at him, and then put my head down and scurried off uh, to my mom's bedroom. And then you know, he left that day, and see, he's an only child. He was born after many, many years of marriage, so a miracle birth. And he was coming to uh, NYU on a postdoc uh, in September of 63, and this was in uh, June, July of 63. 
my parents didn't want to send us to New York without commitment. <laughs> so I was the anchor back home. And his father did not want, as he, his father said, I do not want you coming back with a Mary or a Jane or whatever. <laughs> you know, you have to marry a girl from our community. And so he felt if Raghu was, you know, engaged to me, he would have a reason to come back and not do anything here, you know. And he did. And, you know, the part that I love the best writing about is before Raghu left to come here to NYU, he asked my mother if he could write to me. Mm. And my mother had to consult his father to make sure this was okay. Because <coughs> in the event that the marriage didn't take place, mm. the letters could be held as proof that I was a loose woman. Not that he was a loose man, but oh. I was a loose woman. <laughs> So my mother agreed, his father agreed, and Raghu and I started a correspondence that began as pen pals in September of 1963. The letters ended in May 17, 1964, and we fell in love through our letters. Wow. And so I saved all those letters from those days and called from the letters um, certain uh, well, certain aspects of the letters that is in the chapter called Courtship, and how we got to know each other in this sort of, uh, in this way. And then he came back uh, in on May 17th, I think it was, and we got married on June 5th. Mm -hmm. And I sort of, um, I end the book um, on a sexy note, Whoa. about my <laughs> the miseducation, my <laughs> sex miseducation, um, you know. And uh, so the, the book ends, um, it's called, I think, First Night, you know, it's our first night together. And uh, I got married in June and then came back to New York in August. Mm -hmm. And I was, uh, I just turned 17. And I started NYU as a freshman in chemistry mm -hmm. and did all my, I'm a, huh? 22. He was 22. It was a six year age difference. Mm -hmm. um, but he was well established. He's a bit of a child prodigy. He got his PhD when he was 21. Mm -hmm. And so he had a job in New York. And, you know, uh, we've lived in Greenwich Village ever since. You know, it's been our home for 55 years. Thank you. I want to thank you. Thank you for being a patient of Well, it's so hard to know what to read. And so if you have questions, comments, or, yeah. Tell me your name. Elaine Kingsley. I read your book. And I really am impressed how you had the resilience and the fortitude to to stick with your traditions, whereas trying to become uh, more independent. Yes. Do you have children? Well, uh, as the big says, you know, my oldest son was, uh, you know, killed on 9/11. Oh, no. uh, so that was really, I don't know what word to use, you know, but. I, I can started writing uh, this memoir. But know. if you had a daughter today, oh, everybody asks. Uh. Right, I'm sure because you know you went through so much in trying to bridge. I wouldn't have been that strict, but I think like a lot of mothers, no matter what, there will always be that protective sense when it comes well, to course. the daughter. I think girls are still more vulnerable. Right. Mm -hmm. But you wouldn't have been that strict. You would probably. I would have, you know, one of the things that I that I always regretted, not so much the man I married and I'm very happy with him, is that I never got a chance to be independent. Mm. I went straight from being my mom's daughter right. to someone's wife. And I don't mean like someone, someone, but you know, the role mm. of wife. I never had a chance to really be much of a child. I took care of my younger brother. My father was away all the time. 
and you know I had to help my mom out you know I mean I I was like uh, you know like a, I was almost like a mini mom you know, right, like right, these right. Austin Power movies, mini movies. <laughs> but yeah, you do so have a granddaughter. And two I do have a granddaughter and, uh, yeah, and, and two grandsons. You did not. I have a, another son who's married. You yeah, yeah your granddaughter. Your are you, um, and obviously you're not directly raising her, but are you uh, teaching her the ways of your culture as well yeah, as the American she, ways? In fact, the, the children are interested in the book. And I think one of the babysitters or somebody is reading it and giving them sort of a summary. Nice. And so my granddaughter, who will be nine in, next week, said to me, how could you get married at 16? I'm nine, seven <laughs> years, I can't believe it. No way, you know. <laughs> and it's a, you know, and again, you know, um, most of, I was the youngest. You know, even in my time, I was too young to be married. Mm -hmm. My classmates all got married after they finished their college degree. And I often wish I had had the freedom to finish college first. Right. right. I came to this country very dependent on my husband. And, uh, you know, it, I felt uh, I wanted to be independent. Sure. And it took a long time to achieve that, you know. But over the years, you never thought of arranging a marriage for your son. No. That answers your question about that. Yeah, I, no. yeah, I knew about because that. It, you know, because no. you had a very yeah. difficult time to be a good daughter, a good wife, and everything yeah. else, yet trying to achieve some independence as a person. Not yeah. necessarily a woman, just a person. Yes. Yeah. Are you planning a part two? <laughs> Everybody's <laughs> asking. That's the interesting part. Yeah. <laughs> I've been thinking about it, you know. Um, see, the thing is, is that, <clears throat> you know, my son is around, my husband's around. And of course, 55 <laughs> years of marriage is not exactly, it wasn't exactly smooth sailing. I'm sure not. You know, and so there's a question of what, you know, what to include, what not to, you right. know, even with, with any kind of memoir writing, I think you have to be uh, judicious oh, yeah. in the details you choose to include and those you choose to omit. Um, so, I mean, in all candor, I would not want to include anything that my husband might find hurtful. Right, exactly. You know. Well, you know, the, there's a chapter here on the dowry that his parents right, uh, had right. asked, and that upset him when he okay. read it. Yeah. Well, it was, you know, like, you know, he told me afterwards, you know, af after reading my uh, memoir, that he went to my mom and he told her, I don't want any dowry and everything mm -hmm. else. But I was not privy to that. Right. So I told him I had to write it in terms of what I knew at the time that right. it occurred, mm -hmm. and not in retrospect, yeah, you, you know. Have feelings, really. And again, it's always been a sore point in our marriage mm -hmm. because his parents, you know, were avaricious mm -hmm. and they asked for a lot. And I was very angry with my mother for giving in to that. Mm -hmm. um, that was, we had a big blow up right before the wedding and I found it very hard to forgive her for that. I really felt as if she was bothering me yeah. off and uh, it was humiliating for me. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks yeah. I noticed that I'm a voice and speech teacher. You speak just like I do. You could be from California or yeah. Wisconsin. How did you learn to speak neutral American? You don't sound like you're from Queens. You don't sound no. like Terry, I who know. is from Brooklyn. How did you get this neutral accent? You say it's mine. I listen to you very carefully. You don't say dog. You say dog, right? Yes. How did you learn how to speak? Well, my, father, uh, my father spoke impeccable English. And I British think, English or no? No, my father didn't have a British accent. You know, it was 
American like yours? No, not quite. You know, it was maybe uh, I don't know what word to use. You know, almost a pastiche of uh, you know, like he didn't have like it. it, it some words he had an Indian accent, but for the most part, uh, it's pretty much the way I spoke. And um, my two brothers speak the same way as well. You know, we all, um, I didn't pick up any inflections, which is, um, I don't know. But when I also. You speak, when you speak in the Indian dialect, do yeah, you have an I American do. accent? Or do you no, know? it's completely Indian. So this is your ear. ear. You have an excellent ear. I, you know, I mean, I don't want to sound like, you know, tooting my own horn. I had a gift for languages as a child. Mm -hmm. And my father actually, <laughs> when I say he wanted me to study at the Sorbonne, he actually wanted me to study in order to become an interpreter at the UN. Oh. And he said, yeah. this way you would always be close to me. Oh. And so, as a young child, my first language was English, and then I went to the UN school, I learned French and Latin. Yeah, well, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, I do. I have a French accent when I do speak it. Uh, I'm not as good, oh, I can't do it like I'm not. It's been a long time, but as a child, I was, you know. The UN school had a rule. You could not speak English in the French classes. Mm. So everything yeah. was in French. And then I took Latin. And then as an undergrad, I took German. For chemistry, <laughs> I had to translate all the biostatic journals, you know. And so I've always uh, had a year for language. And um, no, I know, Terry has the Brooklyn accent. I can do this. <laughs> you know, she has or, you know the Long Island. You know. Yes. Uh, here? Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm curious. Uh, writing any book, writing any book can be uh, cathartic. Can be what? Can be cathartic. So, in in what ways, in what ways, have you changed? And I'm sorry for using the word you. <laughs> Not to, don't want to objectify. But what ways have you changed since, you know, even the beginning? of uh, putting putting this together? Oh, in many ways. Um, I began the book, uh, you know, in a very difficult place, you know, uh, after losing my child in such a horrible way. And um, I was really caring, you know, just on the lark. I, you know, I was teaching, you know, I've always taught, but there was something missing inside of me. And, you know, um, the Turkish writer, uh, Orhan Pamuk, had won the Nobel Prize in Literature. And the New Yorker had published his, I guess, acceptance speech when he won the prize. And it, there's one line or a couple of lines where he talks about who he is as a writer. And one of the things that he says that really moved me at that particular time was, you know, writing allows you to create a self that is uniquely yours. You can be whomever you want to be when you're writing. You can stare out the window, you can write a few words, you can get up, you can walk around, but that self is just yours. No one else, nothing else matters. And because of, you know, the tragedy uh, that I, um, that I had to go through, uh, everybody was referring to me as the woman who lost my son on 9-11. You know, everywhere I went, people pitied me. Everybody meant well, but that was how I was identified. And I wanted a space where I could retreat. And I could have written, many people said, why don't you write about the death of your child and this and that. I said, no. And I thought about, you know, you know, where would I go, you know, I've always enjoyed writing and I, I, I've written before. Um, and I said, let me go 
to my childhood. I said, uh, I want to revisit the struggles of my parents, my own struggles. And I felt that it would give me strength to cope with what I had to cope with in the present. And I will tell you that the process of writing was very healing for me. I actually, when you ask me, you know, what did I learn or was it cathartic? Yes, it was cathartic. But I very often never really paid attention, I think, as to why I wear a sari. There's no reason for me to wear a sari. I could call myself American, you know. I don't have to wear a bindi or anything, you know. I, you know, it's like my kids used to say, I could pass for, you know, being European, you know. Or, or. And I began to realize as I wrote this, just how much of those five years in India um, had been ingrained in me that I simply cannot give up on. You know, that um, even though I railed against all these issues of covering up and everything else, it mattered to me. And that I understood that those were aspects of Indian culture that no matter how long I've lived in this country, I'm not willing to let go of. And it made me uh, understand myself uh, better in that sense as to, I didn't feel as if I had uh, sort of a bifurcated personality. I felt more whole after finishing the book. I also understood my mother better. Um, I felt, I, I, there, are, there are parts in the book where I feel I have been harsh towards her. And, um, but again, I had to write it as I felt at the time. But now, you know, after finishing the book, I, uh, I now, in a way, understand her better. And um, again, because my father was well known, I hero worshiped him and not my mom. I sort of always saw her as a pain and a thorn in my side, you know. And I think this allowed me to have more empathy from my own mother. Um, and I actually see now a lot of her in me. <laughs> you know, I admired my mother, you know, I really did. And, um, you know, my strength has, has been tested, you know, to lose a child is probably the mm -hmm. worst ordeal that mm -hmm. I think anyone can go through, particularly hard for a mother. And um, the strength of my mother and what she endured, being a widow at 42 and raising three children, has continued to give me the strength to bear up to my loss. When Vasu, I described Vasu as having grit, I also was Vasu's mother on many occasions, and the apple did not fall far from the tree. And Vasu would give me instruction on what I was to wear, what topics I could talk about, what topics I must talk about, and my and the goal was I should impress her mother that she had a decent, fairly conservative. Friend who was American that she could feel comfortable with, and she had found a, a, a nice American friend who would be approved of. <laughs> My name is Gloria Sass, and I, and I really appreciate your coming and talking with us tonight. I can't wait to read your book. But I did not really realize ever that there would be a correlation between the or, or, um, uh, Orthodox and the Indian culture. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's exactly the same. They still have the mixer. They're still mm -hmm. they, yeah. they mm -hmm. a protocol in that group. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing I want to say is I never wanted to be. My mother married when she was 16, had her first child at 17, and I never wanted to be that person. So I didn't get married till I was 30, and became the classic Cinderella wife. Mm -hmm. You know, that completely dependent on my husband emotionally, not any other way, but emotionally. We're both business people. We both had our own businesses. 
Then I was widowed. And it was that six-year period after I was widowed that I learned really what was independent. Remarried. And I'm the most independent woman I've ever been now. So it seems to me, when I look at you, I see an independent woman. So you might want to rethink that. <laughs> no, I mean, again, I wasn't independent even after I got married. Thank you. Thank you for coming. But I've learned also how, you know, talk about general semantics. I've learned how to find the language to find myself in fear of truth. Mm -hmm. you, know, um, you know, I mean, I've been, you know, I, more than half my life I've been a college teacher. And I work at it, you know, and again, you know, I won't say I was always completely supportive at home, you know, I did it in spite of them. Mm -hmm. And I'm one of these people who plods along, but I never let go of my goals. I will get there. I'm like the, the rabbit and the hare. Mm -hmm. The rabbit uh, who ultimately, or the tortoise, who I mean, whatever it was, sorry, the tortoise. Well, uh, I, I think everything I said about Patsy, you see it <laughs> yeah. in her reading. And, and I thank her for coming. Well, I thank you all. And I hope you'll read the book. I, I brought copies. Thank you. I'm Thank you all. Thanks, Lance. More caring. Everyone.